Islamic Finance Weekly is a program that captures developments in the non-interest financial market space and how Nigeria can tap into the opportunities. Welcome to another edition. In this episode, we take a look at infrastructure financing, particularly at the time the globe requires liquidity, with nations like Nigeria leading the race. At a recent forum, Mr. Daniel Muller, head organization and structuring in credit, gave insight into unlocking the potentials for long-term local currency infrastructure finance in Nigeria. The opportunity really, and, and someone mentioned earlier, Islamic finance as a portion of the total finance is a small fraction of the market. And we can say the same thing for the long-term investors in the market. Pension capital, which is over 10 trillion naira now, because this 9.9 .9 trillion is as of November. So pension funds, have the long-term capital by and large, much more than insurance companies or other investors, but their investment in infrastructure is, is, is really even less than 1%, depending on how you categorize it. Most pension fund investment today is, is invested in secure treasuries or other short-term uh, investments. Um, they're really not being asked to take credit risk by the pensioners. Um, so if we're going to crowd pension funds, really that long-term capital that's looking for 10-year and 15-year investments in debt securities, if we're going to crowd that into infrastructure, which is what the country needs, they're going to need credit enhancement. They're not just going to go blindly into infrastructure projects or really into general corporate lending. Um, so that's where InfraCredit comes in. Our, our mission for our first few years is really to, to provide uh, you know, be the catalyst to crowd in pension money and other institutional capital into long-term infrastructure. These are typically 10-year, 15-year, 20-year corporate infrastructure bonds. Um, the, um, the infrastructure master plan for the country, just for another data point, um, this was set about five years ago. If you take the numbers over the 30 years, it says Nigeria needs $3 trillion in, in investment in infrastructure, which is $100 billion a year. So we really need as much as possible to be mobilizing the local capital. The other advantage is this is long-term local currency uh, you, you know, um, uh, investment. Most projects don't need foreign currency for the life of the project. They might need a little FX to buy some equipment to put the infrastructure in place, but that's a one-off at the start of an infrastructure transaction, just to pay the EPC contractor or the supplier. The truth is most sectors uh, uh, of the economy, if we remove oil and gas, most sectors of the economy are earning Naira, especially since the CBM rule came in about two, three years ago, are uh, really trying to make everyone, really trying to Nairaize the entire economy, saying that, that billing in foreign currencies is even prohibited for most local companies. So most sectors are earning their revenues in Naira, they should be borrowing in Naira. Otherwise, they're going to run into trouble at the next devaluation. And devaluations typically, as we know, they come every few years as oil prices crash. It's not necessarily anybody's fault, but that's that's what happens when, when you're tied to, to one asset like, like the Nigerian economy has been for so long. He identified the infrastructure financing deficit in Nigeria and the requirement for making significant investments that can transform Nigeria's socio-economic landscape. Our funds are local, so we're sitting on $136 million in capital. The idea when InfraCredit was, was in, in, you know, initiated in 2016 was that we should start with $200 million. Well, that's, that was a bit fanciful. You start with what you're able to start with. And that's a, a, you know, a theme around infrastructure generally. You scale projects up. You don't always get what you want for on day one. So we started with $50 million. We now have $136 million uh, in capital. Um, and this also means having these sort of development partners as part of our, our shareholding base. It also means that we can get access to technical grants and other assistance to support a lot of the, the infrastructure projects that, that we can back in the market. Um, when we issue guarantees, um, there's typically these have been bonds to date, although um, Sukuk is also another structure that is within our eligibility criteria. Um, these are senior obligations. We're taking a 100% risk on the performance of the borrower or the issuer, so we're going to take a senior secured position 
on these on you know on these projects or on these infrastructure companies. Um, the when the if and when these companies default, um, which should really never happen, right? Um, if and when these companies default and our guarantee is called, um, it's not that we pay out 20 billion naira in one stretch, right? We meet the obligations of the borrower as and when due, which is what the pension funds want. They don't want one lump sum payment coming to them because a project defaulted. They actually want that steady cash flow over the life of the investment that, they, that, that they've made. Um, so that's where this non-acceleration provision comes in. Um, the sort of infrastructure projects that we back, they should be things that we can remediate. So if we backed, let's say that the you know, um, second Niger Bridge was told and we backed the concessionaire that was doing the, the project. And then during the life of that debt instrument and that concession, a government came in and banned tolls. I said, well, no tolls for a few years here. Now, you structure correctly, the lawyers will all know that you wouldn't enter that transaction, you wouldn't guarantee that transaction, no one would lend to it if there weren't proper arbitration clauses and other things that, that would give you recourse against the federal government. But we would know that, okay, eventually we will win that case in court and they will have to reinstitute the toll, no problem. But for that, that period, you're going to have to remediate that asset. You're going to have to maybe issue another bond to take out the one that's there, no payments on that bond for a few years. Then when the payments start coming again, because that asset's not going anywhere. And someone talked about, can you, on this asset-backed lending, can you really realize that security? Well, the more infrastructure that we do, you know, you, you, what are you going to do? Grab Lagos Ibadan Expressway and sell it? Like, there's really, on, on proper public infrastructure, there's not a lot you can go grab and sell. If we did a, if we back um, a water project um, in, in, say, Wari or another, another city where we're going to do proper retic you know, reticulation and, 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 and make water available, if, if there's a default by the, the, the city authority or the agency that, that's, that's handling that, you can't really grab that asset. So the structuring has to be, has to be perfect as far as your, your ability to remediate that asset, work with the state actors and, and, and get them to honor, honor the agreements. Mula identified the Ijawa Sukuk as a key element for supporting leasing in key sectors like healthcare, agriculture, and clean energy, amongst others. When we look at sectors um, around, um, around, uh, around certain industries, sorry, there's certain industries that we usually talk about a leasing structure as being ideal. One of them is healthcare. Rather than backing one hospital and having that sort of idiosyncratic risk of that one hospital having a problem, why not back the equipment provider that's supplying to 50 hospitals? And that way, if one or two don't, don't perform, you grab that asset, move it to another hospital. And that would be a contractual cash flow driven model across all of these hospitals. You can make sure that that equipment provider is, is, is doing the servicing and maintenance and making sure that you know, these assets are available. Um, and so this is, this is a structure for healthcare where um, we're guaranteeing the, the debt around, say, a $5 billion issuance. They're making that equipment available to dozens of hospitals, um, and, and we still have some recourse to that leasing company, that OEM, because they, they still are, they're the one that wants to sell the equipment to begin with, right? They're the one that wants to be in. The hospitals maybe don't have the balance sheet, or maybe they themselves don't have contractual offtake. They're just counting on people to continue giving you know having babies and getting uh, getting sick so um, the contractual ca cash flows are actually the lease of those those the, the equipment another sector is agriculture um, around tractors you could you could lease um, tractors to you know different communities S those sort of transactions you might want um, the state government to 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 have a role to play because it's not that easy to just go in and grab something from a community that they may see as a vital asset, um, but, but agriculture um, um, equipment may be another leasing structure that we could work in with the Islamic finance. Um, a third one, um, and Jubril, one of, one of my uh, friends here, um, clean energy is, 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 is his game, green, clean. Um, a lot of the mini grids are small companies. You're talking companies that have never borrowed more than you know, 40, 50 million naira. 
and we're set up to be backing you know 20 billion naira projects so how do we pool those mini grid projects because the demand is there each project is viable on its own but it's hard for a credit institution to back one individual company that doesn't have the track record but we could again have an asset leasing structure where 20 different companies doing mini grids are being leased those solar panels and other things. So, so again, these are different leasing structures in three different industries that we think are viable. The one be, people usually think of is housing, but we want to talk about other examples, other sectors where this sort of asset, asset backed um, lending can, can be done. There is a nexus between infrastructure and economy development. As Nigeria seeks to address its infrastructure financing gap, it is clear that there are opportunities for tapping into well structured Ijera Sukuk losing models. And that will be all for this edition of the Islamic Finance Weekly Program. To all our viewers, this period of the COVID 19 pandemic, we ask that you stay safe. You can visit our website, www.voshareng.com or engage us on our social media platform displaying on the screen for Islamic finance reports and analysis. Till we come your way again, thank you for watching and have a nice day.